right, so we've got some pie charts here. Uh, Jim, uh, Duan, what do you what do you think about these results here? As you look at uh, how do you measure the success of your GIS? We've got uh, uh, the majority of folks are looking at anecdotal uh, evidence. There's a pretty significant uh, number of folks with traditional ROI as well. This this is interesting stuff. Um, first, this is Jim Sparks. First comment I would make is that I've noticed at different points in my career that some people are more numbers focused and some like me are more about the stories and it looks like the stories went out just a little bit but numbers are extremely important and obviously if you can tell your benefit story using both numbers and anecdotes you're going to be better off so it's something that i know the geospatial community can improve on we're not real good at talking up the benefit. The, uh, the second question, are geospatial data treated the same? We, uh, wow, uh, so I think we have a little bit of work to do yet. What, don't you just wonder what makes geospatial be perceived as a different kind of public record uh, than the others? Dropping down to question number three, and by the way, we're going to talk about uh, questions one, two, and three as we go through the, the presentation here. But the third question, do you have provisions in state statute that allow for charging? Mm, pretty good split there. Um, and not sure, maybe because those laws are really hard to get into uh, sometimes and understand and take apart. But this is a, an extremely important question when we're talking about open data and sharing data because uh, as we'll see a little, little later on, the, uh, sometimes geospatial data look like, looks like a potential gold mine to those stewards of that data. And finally, does, uh, do, you, do you have open data policies or agreements in place? advantages and disadvantages to, to having those agreements in place, uh, a lot of advantages. It uh, gives the notion of open data and how you share its structure when you do that. So we'll, we'll revisit some of these in just a little bit. Very good. So Olivia, let's go ahead and close those questions out and go to the title slide. Thank you all for answering those questions. That's, that's useful for us. And as Jim said, we'll, we'll look at those uh, again. And uh, Duan will ask for your comments in a, in a little bit. But first of all, we want to, get, again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Eric Sweden, Program Director, Enterprise Architecture and Governance for the National Association of State Chief Information Officers. This webinar is sponsored by the NASIO Data Management Working Group, which resides under the Enterprise Architecture and Governance Program. This is the second in our series, and the first of our presentations by a state. This series of webinars will present on such topics as data governance, data stewardship, the capability maturity model for data management, Agile, and we'll have pre various presentations from state CIOs and GIOs. So stay tuned to NASIO for information on future webinars. Here are our speakers today, and uh, uh, today's webinar will be talking with the state of Indiana. We're very pleased to have Indiana's Chief Information Officer, Duand Neely, here. Duand is also co-chair of the NASIO Data Management Working Group, along with Mr. Stu Davis, CIO for the state of Ohio. We also have Indiana's Geospatial Information Officer, Jim Sparks. Jim has contributed to our library of cross-jurisdictional collaboration. We've got a, a scenario from Indiana that Jim wrote. So Jim is uh, no stranger to NASIO. Today's topic is Managing Change, the Indiana County State Data Sharing Initiative. So thank you, Jim and Duan, for presenting to us today. Uh, Duan, any opening comments, please? You're welcome, Eric, and I'm um, just glad to be here and uh, glad to support my my geographic information officer uh, and, and his efforts here and, and excited to share the great things he's done with uh, the audience today. Very good. I'm going to move on to the agenda and let you see what, uh, what, what is uh, 
the, uh, uh, the program for today. So here's our agenda. Uh, we're asking everyone to please use the chat box for all questions and post to everyone so everyone uh, can see what's been asked. And then we'll respond to questions, as many as we can, at the end of this uh, presentation discussion. And then whatever questions are not answered in the webinar will be answered offline. So we'll put together the questions, the responses from uh, Duand and from Jim, and we'll distribute uh, the, the questions and responses to everyone via email. So Duand, Jim, thank you again for presenting to us today. I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, it, and before I get started, I, so this project is about an effort in Indiana that involves counties sharing their data with a state agency. And I want you to reflect on your state and, and maybe your county, if that's your jurisdiction, and predict in that situation how successful it might be. It's a strictly voluntary effort. I'll describe it more in just a minute. Uh, but I, I think it's a remarkable thing in, in something that uh, the geospatial community in Indiana and across the country, I think, can look to and be proud of. So a little bit of background and context just to get started. The, uh, our, our legislators in Indiana created the Geographic Information Office with state statute that uh, came into effect July 1st of 2007. So my responsibilities are this IC 4-23-7.3, and there's a couple of dozen of them, and that's just way too many things for me to keep track of, but I can count to five if I've got a free hand. And this is how mo those responsibilities break out for the most part. These are the buckets of responsibilities that I like to think about as we uh, look at efforts in the, the GIO office or the Geographic Information Office here in Indiana. So first of all, coordinate GIS efforts, wherever that might be in Indiana. All levels of government involve higher education. We do some things with K through 12. We love our private sector partners. Um, and the next thing is look around the state, see where geospatial data exists, and the best we're able to work with that data so that we get the, the biggest bang out of the buck for that. Just leverage the heck out of it. And a lot of times that means integrating it in a number of different ways. Third bucket is recognize that sometimes we need data that does not exist or maybe needs improved. So go about figuring out how to, to fix that. And for me, what that means often is knocking on doors to find funding. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, do you have $100,000 you might be able to put toward the next ortho imagery project? Or do you have a little bit of money to help improve our national hydrography data set? Um, so that's kind of how that works. The next one is uh, distribute data. The, the more that data is used, the more we get as a return on our investment for it. Conversely, when we put data in a silo and no one can get to it, it really doesn't have much value. So distribute that data, and we have done that in a number of different ways in Indiana. Finally, uh, serve as GIO for state agencies. I will note that this is the only bucket of things that is strictly inward focused. Everything else is both inward and outward. Uh, and also as part of some context, I, I love quotes. Quotes are these little pieces of, of wisdom that you run into now and then. And I want to share with you some of the things that I think guide our efforts. Uh, in the Geographic Information Office here in Indiana. I've heard people talk about how lucky GIS has been in Indiana. We've, we're working on our third orthophotography project right now, um, and to some that probably looks like luck. But I like what Seneca said, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. We try to be as prepared that, as we can be, and we look for those opportunities to take what we know and what we think and, and uh, to do some good good things. Second one is, uh, the actually the next two are kind of related. Secret to getting ahead is getting started, amen. And this is the last one on this page is part of a longer quote and it's probably my favorite of all quotes that I have. Uh, and it says, basically the most important thing you can do is get started and once you commit to an effort by getting started, then you're going to find that help comes from all kinds of places that you just didn't anticipate. I heard uh, 
a wonderful lady. Uh, she was the geospatial uh, coordinator for Georgia's Emergency Management Agency, and she said, you know, Jim, I try to practice the philosophy of making a friend before you need a friend. Great words. And so I thought about that a lot and went, went back and, and figured out that Ethel Barrymore, a long time ago, had said something very similar. And I take that to heart. It's, it's always about relationships. And uh, at the end of the day, no, no matter what we think our jobs are, it's about relationships. And finally, on this page, recognizing that perseverance will win out. It took a long time for water to carve the, uh, the valleys in the Grand Canyon. And let's move to the next one, the final one. We must begin an endeavor, endeavor by focusing on what we can do instead of letting what we can't do get in the way. So whenever we're in a meeting about GIS in Indiana, we try to look around and say, okay, what common ground do we have? What are we trying to do that is the same for all parties or, or similar enough that we can leverage our efforts and not get too hung up on what those differences are? So with that uh, as a, a a beginning with that as context, let's talk about this data sharing initiative. So started in the summer of 2008, I had been on board with the state as the GIO for uh, about, let's see, about a year and a couple of months by then. Um, and basically I, I sent a letter to all county commissioners and said, I'm inviting you to share four particular specific geospatial data sets, land parcels, point addresses, road center lines with addresses and local administrative boundaries. This is a request. It's not an unfunded mandate because it's a request and it also came with a little bit of money, which I'll talk about more about in a minute. The first county, Shelby County, Indiana, I will always love Shelby County, if nothing else, then for this reason, they were the first one to come on board just a little bit after that letter went out. And our 92nd of 92 counties came on board then uh, quite a bit later, uh, April of 2014, and that made 100% participation. So when I ask you to start with, uh, to think about the scenario in your area, I'm not sure if you came up with 100%. We sure had some folks that didn't think we could do that in Indiana, but uh, and, it, and it took a while. And this is the data that we're talking about. So all 92 counties, not quite 7,000 distinct jurisdictional boundaries, almost 600,000 street center line segments, nearly 3 million address points, and well over 3 million land parcels. And I'll talk about the value of these data sets a little bit further on here, but I think most of us can visualize or think about some of the benefits from having those data sets. And by the way, the local stewards are absolutely the perfect folks to take care of these data sets. They understand their local data in a way that none of the rest of us will ever be able to. And these data today, you know, write this down, maps.indiana.edu, can be downloaded or viewed while you're uh, on the Indiana map, either way. I told Eric this is kind of the meat slide from my perspective. So what we're talking about is how do you change? And in the biggest sense, it's how do you change a culture, but it's how do you move the, that status quo bar that you, you see there in the middle of the screen and there's a fellow named uh, Kurt Lewin who long ago did quite a bit of academic work with how to create change. And among other things, his, his basic premise was this. First, you have to unfreeze the status quo. It's, it's there uh, for a reason. You have to figure out ways to unfree those, unfreeze those reasons, then make the change, and then refreeze so that the changes that you have made to the status quo become institutional. And at the same time, he talked about that status quo bar being where it is because of a balance between drivers and local resistors. So I'm gonna spend a, a little bit of time talking about both sides of these, but in particular talking about the local resistors 
because the research noted that change can be more effective if you take away the resistors than if, uh, if you try to uh, force change by adding drivers. And we, if we have time at the end, maybe we can talk about why that might be. I have some ideas. But let's look at some of those local resistors. Here was one I heard a lot. I believe I'm sitting on a gold mine. So I'm looking for dollars if you want my map data. In addition, there were concerns, especially early on, about privacy. This is, this is nitty-gritty data we're talking about here, addresses, uh, parcel lines. Uh, in addition, what would people do with this? What, what would the downstream uses be? And oh my gosh, businesses might make a profit if they were able to get their hands on this data. So we were able to remove or reduce that set of resistors, first of all, by asking the counties to only provide a little bit of, of their data, not all of it. So in the case of parcels, for example, all we ask for is the, the parcel geometry, the line work itself, and a state parcel ID number. With that ID number, we can join all kinds of other data to that. Uh, but also, we, we have... Um, an Access to Public Records Act that governs public data and public meetings in Indiana. We also have a, a public access counselor, and I ask some very specific questions of that counselor and got an opinion that, among other things, said that geospatial data is public data. There's nothing about geospatial data that makes it any different uh, in that perspective, in, in that, that way than any other public data. And it was helpful to remind people of that. Oh, and by the way, the, the gold mine thing, that hasn't panned out anywhere that I'm aware of. If, if you know of places where that's successful, let's talk later. Uh, another resistor, counties didn't want to change the way they were collecting and using the data. They didn't want to change the format. It was that format because of specific business reasons. And it would upset those business reasons if we were to say, county, would you change that? That would be an effort that really didn't give them back anything. Um, so we, we said, ah, don't worry about that. Just give it to us, and we will change the format on the back end so you don't need to worry about it. And they were uh, very thankful uh, for that. So I want to talk a little bit about this schematic. And then I want to turn on a different PowerPoint here. So I'll, I'll pause for a couple of seconds to get that fired up. But first of all, uh, there's a number of things I want to point to in this slide. One of them is the number of collaborators that you see in the middle. In a bit, we'll talk about communication. How do you get a vision communicated? And you can see I had lots of help. But beyond that, you, uh, the, the county data would come into the state. We would churn it through a data homogenizer using some software from Esri and also uh, FME. And that processed data would then come down to a data library within state government. We would push it over to the folks who host the Indiana map. And through the Indiana map viewer and portal, then it was available to everybody else. So give me just a second. And what you're going to see when this kicks off is a bit of a time lapse, beginning with Shelby County, the first county, and ending with the 92nd county, and see how that played out over time. So counties that say yes turn green. Some counties towards the end of the process turned red because they specifically said no. Then they changed their mind. But in the background, while you're watching the time sequence, you're going to hear a little bit of a blog, um, a podcast that came from Very Spatial. Very Spatial is a, a geospatial-oriented uh, podcast that is pretty interesting to us uh, map geeks, and that's what you're going to hear in the background. So let me get this started. 
uh, hold up a little bit. Let's make sure people are seeing your slide Listen. first. Uh, can you put that on hold for just a second? Yep. Okay, now I see your slide. Olivia, do you see it? Okay, we're seeing it now. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and start. It's coming through now. Thanks, Jim. Go ahead. All right, here we go. You're listening to episode 192 of a very special podcast, March 22nd, 2009. Hello and welcome to a very special podcast. I'm Jesse. I'm Sue. And this is Frank. And this week we're joined by Indy Hurt and we'll be talking about... Uh, some geography, some, some technology, some education. And pushing forward, yes. So we're talking about ArcPad, Whirl, Indiana Map, and others. Next up in the news is an interesting uh, story out of Indiana. They have done something that I, working in a state uh, organization, would have thought before now was impossible, <laughs> but they've gotten uh, approximately half of their 92 counties to agree to join this Indiana One Map uh, system and voluntarily offer up their data into a unified data mapping system and set. Um, the idea is that uh, you know they do it for free, and then everybody, 65% of the population is covered under this map, and uh, you get high quality local knowledge, local knowledge information into the system that anybody can access. So it's sort of leveraging the uh, um, strengths of the individuals into one very, really large, impressive piece of work, which hopefully other states will follow, whose example that they will follow very, very closely. And kind of like a, the national map, and hopefully, you know, the national map will kind of take some of this into heart, and maybe it'll even filter all the way up. Yeah, I think it's a little more. Um, a little I, bit, yeah. I think it makes a. I think it makes, it makes a little bit more uh, um, sense to start locally, you know, and act, think globally, as I say, because one of the things, I, one of my personal critiques on the national map was um, trying to get so much into one system. I, I think that starting with a smaller geographic area of, of a state maybe a little more efficient way to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I th it's a very encouraging uh, uh, development, I think, in Indiana. Hopefully it's adopted to all the other states, and then maybe we can integrate that into a national map, and then to buy Coke and make the whole world sing. And Dare to dream. Yeah. Dare to dream. <laughs> all right, let me switch back over. All right, so continuing on, uh, we're still talking about reducing resistance. Here's another one. Counties wanted some something for that data. Uh, and it, you know, what it could be could be a number of things, but it was important for them to be able to show that they got something in return for that. And we were able to reduce that resistor, I think, Initially, uh, with a little bit of funding, we had about $15,000 that came through Homeland Security because Homeland Security had an interest in the, these same data sets. Uh, a little bit later, we had another 3,000 that was part of the uh, Indiana Broadband Mapping Project that went to the counties to support their efforts. But I, I think it's also important to point out, I had mentioned ortho a little earlier, so the state had provided two different vintages of pretty good, high-quality ortho imagery free of cost to the counties. And one of those projects also uh, included LIDAR data. And you see the words financial equivalent. So what we did is we said counties, we're going to spend X numbers of dollars per square mile to get the base product. 
if you have a business case that you want higher resolution or some other product, add money to the pot that we're going to spend, and you get the data. We get the state agencies, the Geographic Information Office gets the higher resolution data. Everybody wins. So I think that's been pretty effective to create a, a culture that says if it's public data and if it's data that one side or another, one partner is probably a better way to say it or another, that it is something that we're interested in sharing. Here's another big one. There was a lot of mistrust. I know it's going to be a shocker for some of you, but when I would come in and say, hi, I'm Jim Sparks. I'm from the state. I'm here to help you. Uh, it, that was taken differently when I first started compared to how it might be received now. People understand that uh, they, they want to see how is this going to work. They want to see how the actual uh, relationship might work rather than the words that anyone in particular might have to say. And it was extremely important, especially turning those red counties to green counties, to attend commissioner meetings and to be able to talk face to face and understand the, the challenges and, and provide re reassurances about what we were trying to do. It takes a while to develop those relationships. And I think as much as anything else, that's why this effort took so long. Another concern was, gee, <clears throat> I know our, our data is not perfect. It might be incomplete. It may be inaccurate. That, that makes us nervous. Uh, and we had and made it clear we, we were very willing to accept data, as I would say, warts and all. Uh, imperfection is OK. Let's get all of that imperfect data out on the table and see what we can do to improve it all working together. One example of that was uh, Putnam County in Indiana received from the Geographic Information Office about $46,000 to help them complete their parcel layer. And that came from the, the broadband mapping project. Those kinds of things go a long way. OK, switching sides of the status quo line. Now let's talk about drivers a little bit. It, it, how it, There's not much that can be more important than being able to communicate the how beneficial this project is. And to do that in an, any number of ways, I'm going to talk specifically about a couple of those in a minute, and celebrate successes. There was a long period of time that I would begin just about any public meeting that I was participating in with a status, with an update of where the data sharing was. And over time, that excitement about progress with the data sharing was co-owned by all my county GIS partners. Everybody uh, would get extremely excited about seeing some prog progress so that the ownership of the change that we were trying to accomplish was uh, shared by a lot of folks, a lot of partners. And that makes the job quite a bit easier. Those uh, Eric had asked a great question a couple of days ago about how communication happened. And, I had mentioned in that schematic slide, it involves a lot of people. Certainly, as much as anybody else, those county geospatial partners helped carry that message over those months and years. The statewide data, once it was homogenized, added a different kind of value than the isolated county by county data sets would have provided. And we, we wanted to make sure that we talked that value up every chance we got. The, the perceived value of that is good for this office. It's also good for the county partners and all that big set of, uh, of, of partners um, and stewards and stakeholders that helped with the project. And I, I want to mention that I, I think it was really the, the, the model for this is in a lot of ways, like the broadband mapping project that I had mentioned. So uh, it, it leverages the strength of each level of government. The data stewards at the local level were the perfect folks to be creating and maintaining the, uh, those data. The state played a role as a data integrator. We were able to pull that together. And then in the broadband mapping project, anyway, uh, our federal partners were funders, and then they were aggregators across the nation. 
This next item is uh, kind of goes to that return on investment notion that, you know, you, you paid what you paid, and that's in the past. Can't change that at this point. What we can change is the value that we get for that investment, and we can very much influence that. And in, in this uh, situation, the influence is that we get a lot more people using that data. One of the uses that I wanted to point out every chance that I got was uh, when FEMA came to Indiana a, a number of times due to natural disasters, um, we had uh, some flooding in Indiana that affected 82 of our 92 counties, and Sean Donovan from FEMA was here for that. He also came into Indiana when we had some tornadoes hit southern Indiana one year. Talk about that in a minute, too. But he, he wanted to let us know that he really appreciated being able to get a lot of the data that he needed for his field verification from one place. And it was good for him. It was also good for our citizens because it shaved a lot of time off that process so that people were uh, receiving money to get back into their homes quicker than they might have otherwise. And recognizing that in the geospatial community, there's no them, it's only us. What do we want to do? All right, so you can tell what this slide's about, but I'm going to do it anyway for just a second. Uh, and beginning with this Deloitte study. So this is from the UK. And if I remember right, this was, I, it, it's been, several, this is several years old now. I can't remember if it was 2008 or 2012. But I'm pretty confident that if we did that study in this study in the States today, that we'd end up with the same results. And that is looking at all these different kinds of data open data, which data set, which group of data is most widely applicable across the most sectors. And I know it's just a little bit blurry, but I'll help you out by saying if you go all the way over there to the far left, the tallest column is geospatial. So no surprise to the, the GIS folks on the call, we know geospatial data is useful in all kinds of different ways. I had talked about the ortho and LIDAR. At one point in time, a couple of years ago, I asked the GIS community to send me little short stories of how they were receiving benefit from ortho or LIDAR. And I was very uh, pleased. I got back bunches and bunches of these little two and three paragraph stories, enough that when I put them together, I had over 40 pages of anecdotes. And I assigned keywords to what that benefit was, and then I did the word cloud here of those key benefits. And it's, it's literally everything from art and archi architecture to, um, to zoology, so the whole gamut. And uh, contact information is coming towards the end of this. If you ever need some of these stories, just let me know. I'm very happy to share. Other ways of looking at the benefit, billable hours reduced, millions saved, uh, it's been a bonus for our region, helps, helps us to pass savings on to government, and it, it goes on. This is a, a flyer that I put together, pointed mostly to get back to my county partners. And, and I'm going to start with the one on the, the right-hand side here because it's the showstopper as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Dave Weiss, who's the executive director of the Indiana Integrated Public Safety Commission, noted that when agencies share data, lives are saved. Enough said. But he went on to say, and public offices become more efficient. So it helps public health and safety. What about economic development? GIS can make what is seemingly unrelated relatable. Access to local GIS data is vital to help us understand our communities and the economies. This is a, a return on investment kind of study that was done a few years ago. And it was focused on the Indiana map, but mostly on the orthophotography. It recognized that it was, there was about a 34 to 1 return on investment on that data. That's a little better than my 401K is doing right now. 
Um, or another way to look at it is that for the 350 or so people who were surveyed for the study, uh, they came up with a, a total of about $1.7 billion of projects that were supported by that data set in the, in the, uh, the Indiana map. In fact, uh, about 90% of those folks said they couldn't do their project without the geospatial data, in particular the ortho imagery. So at the beginning, we had some polling question that had to do, questions that had to do with, uh, one of them had to do with benefit. Here's something that I just want to leave you with as we're closing out here. A uh, traditional return on investment, however you might want to do that, uh, produces credible numbers, but it is extremely time consuming. I've done a couple of these in, in a past life, uh, one of them for an Indiana County, as a matter of fact. They're onerous. It's hard work. It's, uh, it's a lot of interviewing and number crunching, and it may be difficult, so difficult that it's, it's out of the reach for geospatial do-it-yourselfers. And so, so traditional return on investment is in some form or another taking the total of uh, value of the benefit and expressing it over the cost of uh, the GIS to produce those benefits. But how about thinking of something different that we can do? And this is uh, an idea that uh, the director of the Indiana Geographic Information Council and I came up with as we were making a long drive to someplace in, in northern Indiana. What about a utility of investment? So I think it could return credible numbers. I believe that it could be accomplished in a reasonable amount of time for GISers. It's something we could do ourselves. And it basically says, Instead of benefit, let's, let's see what, how much utility or how much GIS is supporting other things that are going on in an organization and put that over cost. So uh, just very quickly, think of uh, a county's, um, think of a county's budget and all the line items in that budget and create a new column over the right-hand side and, and say yes if GIS supports that line item or no if it doesn't, and then add up all the things that GIS supports. Or if you wanted to get fancy, then you might be able to put in a percentage that you think GIS supports of that line item. And then total that up and ex ex come up with a, a number that's that over the cost. And finally, I, I want to leave you with this slide, and we can uh, get to some, some questions here. but. I think that the reason that Indiana GIS has looked to be so lucky is that we've done a lot of things to try to get the train to stay on the same track instead of running down dual tracks or multiple tracks. And the long and short of that is that we've, we've had some success. Eric, I'm going to stop right now. This is uh, a little quicker than I expected. Um, this is good. But maybe, Thank you. Maybe, yeah, you're welcome. We'll move to questions. This is great. Uh, really appreciate getting this story. Uh, and, and we've got uh, some questions that are coming in. But uh, let me start out with, uh, with this question. So back in our 2016 NASIO CIO survey, we were asking our CIOs, and, and I'm sure they were tapping their GIOs on this, what categories of services have you migrated or do you plan to migrate to cloud? And you know, when you look at the mechanism, uh, the mechanisms you may use to share data, uh, I would like to learn how have you used cloud? Now in that question, here's what the results are, Jim. So what categories of services have you migrated to cloud? Geographical information systems. So 13% of the states said they were done, 31% ongoing, 17% planned. Uh, you know, how does how do you uh, react to those kinds of numbers when you look across the counties? How many counties are doing something similar, moving to a cloud? And is that something you've been exploiting to uh, share geographical data? It's definitely something that we're exploring. But I, I think that I would want to ask that question: What technologies are geospatial folks looking at? to reduce the cost of storage of very, very, very large geospatial data sets. 
uh, LIDAR and ortho in particular, uh, but just about any kind of GIS data you'd want to think about, they're, they're big compared to uh, documents, for example, really big. Um, I think we have something a little over 20 terabytes of LIDAR and ortho data, and that is growing as we're in the middle of a, another refresh of our orthophotography. That's a lot of data. So if you can figure out how to reduce the cost of storage, even by a few percent, um, that, that's going to make a, a big difference in, in the cost of keeping those data. So to answer your question directly, I am not aware of any counties that have pushed their GIS up to the cloud at this point. Okay, very good. Hey, we've got other questions coming in here. Let me, uh, let me run uh, some of these uh, from our participants. Uh, by you and DeWand. So here's our first from participants. Executive branch state enterprise operations typically focus only on state agency needs. How do Internet of Things and Indiana statutes encourage or support intergovernmental relationships necessary for your success? Well, and I think that's uh, Indiana Office of Technology. So. Hey, oh, Curtis, I'm sorry. Glad you're on. <laughs> IoT, Internet of Things. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, yeah, it looks the same. Uh, the uh, the slide that had the five buckets of of responsibilities for the Geographic Information Office towards the beginning of the PowerPoint uh, pointed I, at that point as we were going through that, I I wanted to make sure people understood that four of those fives, uh, four of those five buckets were outward as well as inward focused, and only the the fifth one, serve as GIO for state agencies, is is the one that's the only one that is strictly uh, focused on state agencies. So, I feel that I have a statutory responsibility to work with city and county partners when it comes to geospatial, and uh, I, I, I try to do that every chance I get. Very good. Another question here, Jim. Can you review funding sources uh, the state used to leverage partnership funds? I can, um, and, and I need to, to start back with that, um, that state statute. Uh, it created a GIS fund, and yep, 4-23-7.3, it, it created a statewide mapping fund but I, I think what happened was that that language was was put in maybe late on the day on Friday, and then uh, Monday morning came around, and there were other issues that uh, occupied our legislators, and they never quite got back to to figuring out how much money to put in that fund. So the uh, Indiana Office of Technology funds essentially the operation side of things with help from grants wherever we can find them, but uh, salaries in, in office and office equipment and, that, and a little bit of travel, that kind of thing. Um, when it comes to projects, though, we're on our own. And to date, we have figured out uh, how to come up with a little over $11 million. And I saw something a little earlier today that committed another $6.3 million for uh, high-resolution LIDAR data for the state, and none of that was appropriation. Um, none of that came from a single funder. It was from a lot of different folks, uh, sometimes state agencies, uh, sometimes federal agencies, sometimes as part of a grant that doesn't say GIS, it says something else. Um, the the broadband mapping project helped a lot, but just real quick, so since we have some time, I, I want to tell a story about funding. It, it was not too long after I had started this job, and I knew that our 2005 orthophotography was getting a little bit stale, and I knew that needed to be addressed sooner rather than later. So uh, I went out and started knocking on doors, and I knocked on a lot of doors, and basically my question was this. Uh, do you have $6 million that you could give me to do another ortho project? Because that's, that's about the cost of the 2005 project. And the answer in every case was no. Sometimes it was a little more descriptive than no, but that was, that was no. 
Um, and then one day I got a call from someone from the Indiana Department of Environmental Management that had some money that had come available as part of a, uh, a grant concerning Great Lakes, Great Lakes improvement. And as I recall, that was maybe $150,000 or something like that, uh, a long way from $6 million. But I went back and knocked on the same doors again, but this time I said, I have a little bit of money. Do you have a little bit of money? And lo and behold, the, that little bit of starting money made all the difference, and we were able to come up with uh, enough funds to do another project. Uh, and it, it, this kind of goes back to that um, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Hopefully you have a plan stashed somewhere that says, here are our priorities, here's some costs associated with those priorities. If I found a little bit of funding or if there's a grant that I could grab hold of or a piece of to accomplish this effort, then I've already got a plan. I've thought it through, and uh, and I would be able to react very quickly. So, uh, be prepared and look for opportunities. Very good, Jim. Here's another question: Can you elaborate on how you've minimized the burden on contributors by accepting disparate data models and aggregating for universal usage? I can, absolutely, and it's a great question, and it's, it's an important point of how this all works. So um, when, when I started looking around, I noticed that there were several different groups who were interested in these same data sets. Indiana Department of Homeland Security was one of them. NDOT was one of them. Um, the Indiana Ge Geographic Information Council was one of them. Indiana MAP was another one of those. And uh, everybody got in a room one day and uh, were, were very nice to, to listen to me pitch the idea that if we could just broaden our perspective a little bit about what everyone was trying to accomplish, then we, we could probably all get what we needed. And when we started pulling in our county partners uh, with just, just sort of brainstorming on how the, all this might work, it became very clear that that resistor was going to be a big one, that counties, uh, county GIS folks did not have enough hours in the day to build their data in the format that worked for them and then also change it in a format that worked for me. Uh, but there was a project that, that Homeland Security, Indiana Department of Homeland Security was working at that time with ESRI and with um, Safe Software using their uh, FME uh, software that did a lot of what we we needed it to do so that no matter what the data looked like in the beginning, if, if we had a good notion of the structure of that data coming in from the counties, then uh, it was, it was kind of like mapping software, not mapping in the sense of GIS, but mapping this equals this in that sense. Um, that, that we could change those that data structure into what we needed. So that was one part of it. Another part was that we didn't want to be calling someone at the county every time that we wanted to harvest the data. So what we tried to do and were largely successful in doing was uh, creating web feature services at the county level. And uh, my, my version of what that did was it, it built digital faucets so that whenever we needed to, in the middle of the night on a weekend, we could open the digital faucets and the data would stream through those, uh, those, those that, that infrastructure we had put in place. It didn't be, need to be initiated by anyone on the county side. We just opened the faucets and it came in and we were done. We, we would shut the faucets again and then process the data through our homogenizer. So that, that was our approach. First, uh, figure out a software solution, but also second, figure out a data distribution solution and make sure that neither one of those was a hardship for our county partners. Very good. You know, we've seen uh, circumstances uh, like in the state of Michigan where 
the partnership between state government and local government has been such that it's surfaced applications and solutions from local government to state and back down again. So in line with what you just, uh, your, your description of, uh, you know, the, the uh, circumstance in Indiana, are you seeing that uh, kind of situation where, in fact, people are creating solutions that can be shared not only across the county, but you're tapping into these solutions as well, and, and do you have a, some sort of clearinghouse or some sort of a mechanism for sharing uh, these kinds of sh solutions related to geospatial data? And it might be any line of business, public safety, public health, economics, transportation. Uh, have you gone in that direction but, at all? Let me answer that question a couple of different ways, Eric. One, one way is that, yes, that, that's really what the Indiana map is all about. Uh, if any of you ever get a chance, just go maps.indiana.edu. You'll, you'll open up a portal that has a viewer. Uh, it also has a catalog of geospatial data layers. You can search for any one of those layers through a search box. It's got pre-canned maps that are built. When you find layers of interest, you can click on a button and get the metadata for that, and that particular data set. If you are convinced that it is going to work for you or you want to investigate more, then you can download that data. So. That whole notion of the Indiana map really was, I think, put into high gear uh, in part because of the data sharing project. But the other thing that happened, or is happening, it's still in progress, is that I had mentioned taking the data warts and all from the county. And that has been extremely beneficial. I don't think until you get all the data pieces piled out on top of the table and you start looking at them, that you can understand in a, a significant way where, what the differences are, one county to another. For example, uh, County A and County B are adjacent to each other. County A says, you know what, we think that a right-of-way is, a, the center, that a center line is the center of a right-of-way. County B right next door says, no, that's, that's not true. Um, a center line is the center of pavement. Often those two things are pretty close, but not exact. And so we, we recognize as a result of the, the data sharing initiative and having all this rich data that we can look through, that is a, uh, a business process that we need to figure out a solution for either everybody move to the same standard or figure out a programmatic way to uh, maybe put a connector between those two things so that when we get to next gen 911, for example, uh, we'll be a little closer to having a routable network than we are right now. You couldn't route with what we have. It's useful uh, and it's very useful, but it's not to the degree usefulness does not include uh, the, the features and attributes that would make it routable. Very good. Here's a com uh, comment question from Pat Cummins. Uh, hey, Pat. First of all, she could, yeah, go ahead and uh, look at that question, Jim. So she's essentially going in the direction, now that you've got this started, is this established practice? Do counties use the data services regularly? They do. Thanks for the question, and Pat. The stats for the, uh, the viewership for the Indiana map is one that I should have etched in my brain. Um, I don't remember how many visits it gets a day or annually. The one that sticks with me is that about 400 maps are made um, a, a day on the Indiana map putting together these data sets. And I can tell you that our county partners, our city partners, our private sector partners, uh, federal government folks that we uh, share efforts with, and a lot of others go to the Indiana map to, to use the viewer, but also to download the data. I am on part of the, uh, I'm on the distribution of when people have problems with the Indiana map or they have questions. So I get to see a lot of times who's 
using the Indiana map, and it's all over the board, and I think that's a wonderful thing. So, yes, Pat, I think that it has matured to the point where um, counties could probably live without it, but it would not be their preference. They could live without it for a while because they've already got their own data, which is most of what they use, but they come to the Indiana map to find everything else, as we all do. Okay, and she's got a question similar to where we were headed a little bit earlier. Do you have, uh, do you share apps on the portal as well as the data? No. Uh, right now that is data only. There are a number of applications built in, so you can do a variety of things with that data, but it, we don't have a library of apps. Um, Pat, we in large part depend on you folks at Esri to help with the, the marketplace and with our liaisons uh, to Esri to help us understand what other people have built already so that we can take advantage of that. And that works pretty well, too. Jim, you've been looking, you know, focusing here on county data, state data, uh, but are you, do you see this on the horizon or has this already been in place where, in fact, uh, with states uh, like Ohio, uh, Michigan, uh, Illinois, uh, where people are doing uh, regional analysis, so their, their, their analytics is beyond state boundaries, and so they need your data as well as other states, and they're trying to bring that together. Have you seen any regional kinds of uh, activity? Oh, emergency yes, management, for instance. Absolutely, and, and this is coming through the CISER organization, Tenacio, so National States Ge Geographic Information Council, uh, Curtis, and I both are, are members of that organization, is doing a lot right now with trying to uh, take the data sharing model up, up another level. And I've had some great conversations with our friends over in Ohio about uh, maybe just starting with, with two states um, for these four or what other geospatial data layers would be of interest. But, um, NISJIC is doing that, that same kind of thing uh, in a number of ways already so that we can, we can build national data layers in much the same way that we've talked about here. Very good. I think we're going to want a webinar on that sometime in future, uh, Jim, so uh, help me uh, orchestrate, uh, orchestrate that, okay? Uh, I can tell you that NISJIC would be happy to sort of capture the salient points of all those efforts and, and put them in one place and talk about that. Very good. Uh, this brings us to the top of the hour here. Uh, really glad to have you here, Jim and Duand. Uh, any final comments, Duand, as we come to closing this uh, session this afternoon? Yeah, the only comment I have is for the, you know, the, the counterparts of myself and the IT-specific folks that, that may be on the call is, if you have someone doing the uh, the GIO role like I do with Jim, is collaborate with them early and often, and, and and take tips from them on how they how they kind of collaborate and work with uh, the local governments, and uh, that that's what I'm doing here, trying to steal his good ideas and and put them to use in, in other areas, especially around data sharing, and not just kind of siloing siloing them in into the geographic space only. Good. Jim, any parting comments, please? Yeah, just, just one quick final thought, and that is that what I've talked about here today is the way that Indiana has been doing this, but uh, other states are doing great things that work in a way that is best for them that's different than this, um, some parts the same, some parts different. But I, I would not want anybody to think that Indiana is the only place doing good work with data sharing, because it certainly is not. There's a lot of other folks across the country that are doing great stuff. Very good. And uh, just a final note to everybody on the call, we are going to pull these questions together with responses and distribute to everyone. And uh, Jim, Duan, thank you very much for joining us. And thank all of you who participated in this afternoon's webinar. Stay tuned. We've got uh, more subjects coming in the coming months. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.